Yes, I think it's working, right? Yeah, we can see it. Then, Fine. thank you, Raphael, for the kind introduction and the opportunity to speak in this Biosolver T webinar series. And also from my side, a kindly welcome to our audience. Today's topic will be the elucidation of the selectivity determining features of targets and off targets with highly conserved binding sites and also how to exploit these features for the design of selective inhibitors. Some of you might be familiar with this challenge if you're working with kinases, for instance, but today's model system will be the n to u transferase of a parasite and the human homologue. Um, before going into detail with our target, maybe we have a short look at how we can achieve selectivity in general. Well, in some lucky cases, we start off with a target to which our ligand binds, and we don't have a structural homologue off target. That might be the case for some antibiotics, but more often we find an off target with more or less structural similarity. One of the most obvious things we can exploit is the overall shape of the binding site or the size, some complementarity in it. We might find, whoops, the off target being a little smaller, a little bit narrower, causing a steric clash with our ligand, but we might also find it the other way around, where we have an off target with a larger binding site, and there we have a lower complementarity kind of holds in the interaction and thereby losing affinity and getting selectivity through this. We might also be able to exploit structural differences like uh, different residues. We have a certain donor acceptor profile or charge profile to follow. And if a residue is exchanged with different properties, maybe it happens that an attracting interaction is replaced by a repulsive one. And that is something we can easily exploit for selectivity as well in many cases. In some special lucky cases we find for our target an allosteric site, so our ligand binds there, and this binding is somehow translated to the active site, the catalytic site in the cartoon illustrated by the gear wheels, and thereby modulating the enzyme's activity. But we find also the cases where none of these strategies can be applied for our target and off target but we still end up with some possibilities. For instance, we can have a look at structural dynamics, the flexibility of our target and off target. This may range from a conformational selection event or an induced fit mechanism, but we also find more subtle changes like the rigidification of certain side chains of residues or something like this. And at this point, we end up needing more than just one crystal structure if we think of flexibility for conformational change. We need at least two structures when we talk about x-rays and the more subtle the changes are, the more difficult it gets. We can get some ideas from NMR spectroscopy studies of the protein or at least some hints are possible to get by B-factor analysis. And the last point to mention you might be familiar with is the hydration of the binding site. We are working with water at the solvent and with this water in the binding site, we have a certain network of water molecules and the water molecules are more or less coordinated, maintaining more or less decrease of freedom and displacement of these water molecules might result in more or less gain of affinity, which is usually referred to as happy and unhappy waters, as you can see in the cartoon. So now let's continue with our model system, the n mirrors to transferase NMT. This enzyme catalyzes the transfer of the C14 saturated fatty acid, myristate, from its cofactor bound form myristoyl CoA, and transferring this myristate to the N terminal glycine of several um, substrate proteins, making them more lipophilic and thereby kind of regulating activity or performing some membrane anchoring and so on. And NMT has been discussed as a potential target for a various number of diseases ranging from common cold up to cancer. But most of the work has been performed with parasitic infectious diseases, uh, mostly neglected tropical diseases. And LMNMT, the NMT of Nishmania Major, has a specific role in this context because, because it's not only a target, but also is often used as a surrogate for crystallography where the crystal structure of the explicit target is not available like NMT of trypanosomes. 
And therefore we end up with several crystal structures of LMNMT and lots of activity data, as well as for the human homolog, the natural off-target HSNMT1. If you now look at the structure, we can here see in the middle the overall structure in the cartoon representation. We find here in the lower part with this cyan green, the cofactor minus to CoA, and in dark green, not that easy to see here, an inhibitor which is competitive to the peptidic substrate. If we now have a closer look into the binding site and the binding mode of this specific inhibitor from this sulfonamide series, we can see some specific interactions. We find an H bond with the serine residue over here to this pre-methylated pyrosol moiety that is nicely stacking in between some aromatic and aliphatic residues. We find the sulfonamide, which is only involved in water-mediated interactions, and then we have another aromatic system nicely stacking in between further aromatic residues, especially this tyrosine on the right is of importance in this talk. And then we have another aromatic or also possible a more flexible aliphatic linker that connects to a basic center over here, which forms an ionic interaction with the C terminus of NMT. And this basic center is nothing else than a mimic of the N terminal glycine of substrates. And if we now compare our, so to say, target LMNMT and the off-target HSNMT1, we keep the color code yellow for LMNMT and blue for HSNMT1, we see in the binding site defined as six angstrom around the ligand, many identical residues with identical orientation, but we also find three differences. On the right-hand side, we find histidine in LMNMT and asperogene in HSNMT1, but the side chain is oriented far away from the ligand, not forming any interactions. And the same also accounts for the other two differences. The C-terminal residues we find in LMNMT methionine 420 and leucine 421, and in HSNMT1 leucine 495 and glutamine 496. Again, the side chains are oriented away from the ligand. The interaction here is from the C-terminus of NMT not from the side chain of the residue. But besides this high similarity, um, also we find in the literature selective ligands, not only this one ligand number one, we've seen in the crystal structure with this not selective, we have low nanomolar potency for both NMTs. But within the series, we find this compound number four. We don't miss two and three very much. They are further examples for non-selective sulfonamides. But this number four is highly selective with two nanomolar potency FKI for LMNMT and 428 nanomolar for HSNMT1 within a selectivity of around 200 fold. And you find also structurally different scaffold like this one, compound five, a little less active overall with 975 nanomolar potency for LMNMT and around 15 micromolar potency against HSNMT1, which results in at least 16-fold selectivity. And that was the starting point of our studies. These structures, we resynthesized them and retested them in the assay, but we also performed isothermal titration calorimetry experiments and also performed MD simulations, either starting from crystal structures if available or starting from docking poses. And of course, we also tried to crystallize those compounds in complex with the NMTs. And luckily we were able to get the NMT complexes for this selective compound four with both NMTs. And what we see here is the binding mode is highly similar to what we've seen for the non-selective ligand, number one. But we also see that the binding mode is basically identical between LMNMT and HSNMT1. And again, the three different residues here on the right and the C-terminal ones orient the side chain away from the ligand. So we have no real reason why this compound should be selective for LMNMT over HSNMT1, even though we have the crystal structure. Nevertheless, we started with site-directed mutagenesis to exchange these three residues specifically against those of the other enzyme, ending up with an LMNMT with an HSNMT1 binding site and vice versa. And by doing so, we made three observations. First of all, LMNMT with the three exchanged residues was 
no longer catalytically active, so we did not get any IC50 or KI values here. But for HSNMT1, with the three exchanged residues, we found it's still active. And we also have seen that the affinity of compound four, which previously was a selective one, was largely increased, basically abolishing this selectivity. However, for compound five, the other structure that was selective, this was not the case. And that is kind of surprising because we start off with a conserved binding site, but for selectivity, there seems to be not only one, but two features indeed for different kinds of inhibitors. And we also wanted to narrow it down if it's really those three residues or if less is important. And the single mutants showed us that the residue preceding the C terminus, in which is directly interacting with the ligand, is the most important one on the one hand causing the inactive LMNNT enzyme and on the other hand causing the increased affinity of this compound four. And as an orthogonal method we used isothermal titration calorimetry and again we observed several things. On the one hand we've seen for LMNMT that binding is more driven by enthalpy while it's more balanced between enthalpy and temperature dependent entropy in HSNMT1, not only for this selective compound four, this also accounts for the other compounds, but for the mutant NMTs, the increase of delta G does not orient, originate from an increase of delta H, but from more favorable entropy term. So differently what you might expect that the binding profile and the thermodynamic profile becomes more similar between those enzymes it becomes even more dissimilar by this increase of entropy. And even though we knew now what mutant or what residue is decisive for selectivity, we still had no structural or dynamic clue for it because the interactions, as I said, are the same. And therefore we turned on with MD simulations and I think Raphael has another poll for you on this topic. Yeah, thanks Christian. So I've prepared another poll in order to get to know how familiar are you with MD simulations? Um, yes, I'm using it in my established workflows. Yes, but I'm not extensively using it. Oh, no, but this is of great interest for future projects. Oh, no, I have never done that. So you can vote right now. 50% already voted. And this might help Christian to explain more precise or in more detail based on your personal background. And um, so I'm going to close this poll in uh, three, two, one. And you can see, so 35% and 33%, so 60% uh, know something about MD simulations and 30% um, are not that familiar with it. So maybe you can just, uh, explain a little bit for these 30 percent. Okay, um, okay I think I continue with the next slide. So that's basically what you see in an MD simulation. You see the movements of a protein in solution if you want to and what we've seen in our MD simulations that run about 50 nanoseconds or not about exactly 50 nanoseconds per ligand protein complex and for the APO structure as well you observe the high stability of the overall structure, no large conformational changes. And what we also observed were stable binding modes of the ligands and very high similarity of the hydration sites because we performed in these simulations with explicit solvent where you can see where certain water molecules tend to be or which hydration sites tend to be occupied. So we had a little more look in the detail of the protein dynamics and therefore we used the metric called order parameters S square. These order parameters originally come from NMR spectroscopy and describe the flexibility of a certain bond vector or its movement over time. And these order parameters are related to the conformational entropy of residues and it has been shown that MD simulations are quite reasonable be able to reproduce experimental order parameters. So we calculated these order parameters for our residues in the MD simulations and order parameters can have values between one for very rigid and zero for fully flexible regions. And we had a look at the sidechain order parameters, especially of our residues. 
And what we found there was for in this uh, this is an excerpt of three simulations or three complexes for the ligand free simulations in blue for the non selective compound one bound and for the selective compound four bound simulations we analyzed the order parameters of course we calculated all but we had a closer look at the binding site residues and the second shell residues and we found something very interesting close to those residues that seem to be important for the selectivity so the c terminus and the preceding residue so methionine 420 and leucine 421 and lmnmt where we observed no large changes in the order parameters. We see for methionine, low order parameter, flexible side chain, but staying flexible even if a ligand is bound, while the C-terminal leucine is starting with a high order parameter, being rigid, staying very rigid. Looking like a little bit different in HSNMT1, we have a more or less flexible or rigid leucine 495, the residue preceding the C-terminus, and the C-terminal glutamine 496 is very uh, very flexible in the ligand-free form, but upon ligand binding, it becomes more rigid, and especially if the selective compound number four is binding, which would look like this for the APO simulation and this for the simulation with the compound four bound. If we now have a look at the MD simulations with the exchange of leucine 495 to methionine, the one where compound 4 loses the selectivity, becoming more um, a more potent inhibitor of HSNMT1, L495M, we observe the methionine being flexible, yes, but we also observe that the C-terminal glutamine, the rigidification we observe for the, apple, uh, for the wild type, is very lower because this glutamine is already pre-organized, already very rigid in the APO structure. And our hypothesis is that um, this is the selectivity determining feature because if this compound four binding with this rather large bulky moiety, this um, heterocycle, this aliphatic heterocycle, rigidifies the C terminus in HSNMT1 by a huge amount, but for the mutant, we see it's already very rigid, and therefore this rigidification, this entropic penalty is reduced, and therefore this is uh, the selectivity determining feature in this case. But how about this other compound, this compound 5, which was not affected by the point mutation described um, at all? Well, then we have a Again, a look at the crystal structure. This was already published earlier, and we see some differences in the binding mode. On the one hand, we see that the ligand with this fluorinated aromatic system over here is lacking the H bond acceptor for the serine residue. Maybe this explains the overall lower affinity. But we also see a difference in the binding mode overall, defined by the orientation of this tyrosine. If we have a look at the sulfonamide ligands, the cyan ligand and the cyan, uh, the cyan colored side chain. There we have a nice pie stacking and um, the binding side over here, the sub pocket is basically closed. If compound five is binding, this tyrosine is kind of opening a hydrophobic sub pocket where the indole moiety of this ligand can bind to. And an initial hypothesis for the selectivity of this ligand was that the open conformation of this tyrosine residue is more favored in LMNMT while it is disfavored in HSNMT1. So we had a closer look at this and started off with crystal structure analysis of the APO structure. But there you find this kind of 50 50 occupancy powered by electron density. And this shows that you find both open and closed conformation for both NMTs in the APO structure in the crystal. And also our MD simulations showed that you have. If you have a look uh, in red, you see the simulation of compound one binding to the closed conformation. In blue, a simulation of compound five, obviously binding in the open conformation. But for the APO structure without a ligand, in yellow, you find switching in between open and closed conformation, but dominantly being in the open conformation. And this finding was that um, this also accounts for LMNMT, but also for HSNMT1. And this was also supported that the open conformation itself cannot be defining selectivity, 
because shortly after a publication showed that there are open conformation binding inhibitors like this compound seven and cyan green compared to dark green, the selective compound five. And this inhibitor here, compound seven, binds to the open conformation but is not selective at all with 10 nanomolar IC50 for parasitic NMT and 20 nanomolar for HSNMT1. This is Leishmania donovani, but uh, the results are comparable with LMNMT and we will show the results on this later. But within the series, there's a in very interesting pair of compounds, these two, 6 and 6A, which only differ in one single substituent. If we have this chlorine over there, we have a molecule inhibiting both NMTs with similar potency, but if we don't have this chlorine substituent, just the hydrogen, we suddenly end up with a 20-fold selectivity between the enzymes. So again, we had a closer look at crystal structures and NMT simulations, and we found something over there close to this tyrosine that differs between the two NMTs. In HSNMT1, we find a certain water network with, six, with cis explicit water molecule W1, and you find not a water molecule in LMNMT at the identical position. And exactly this is the region where the selective compound 5 binds to LMNMT. And as you can see here, this would clearly clash with the hydration site in the HSNMT1. Interestingly, we found that the hydration site is found in LMNMT for complexes with the sulfonamide ligands, where you find a water molecule close to the coordinates of W1 from HSNMT1. And our MD simulations showed something very similar. We can see here. On the one hand, we found density for the water molecule or occupancy for a water molecule in all simulations of LMNMT in complex with the sulfonamides, one till four. These are all sulfonamide compounds, and in complex with the non selective ligand 6A. While we did not find this water molecule in our MD simulations in the APO structure, and also we did not find this water molecule if the selective compounds are bound. And the MD simulations of the human NMT showed that we always find the water molecule over there at this position, no matter if APO structure, selective ligand, or non selective ligand. And we also calculated the delta G of the water molecules with the SPAM method, but um, I'm not going too much into the details and not to stressing it too much. But on a qualitative level, at least you can see that the values for comparable complexes between LMNMT and HSNMT1, this hydration site in HSNMT1 has lower delta G values. So this water molecule seems to be more happy or at least less unhappy compared to this hydration site of LMNMT. And um, as I said, these compounds five and six, the selective ones seem to displace or bind where this water molecule should be in LMNMT, or better said in LMT there is it not, but in HSNMT there it is found. So this might interfere somehow with the ligand and their binding mode, slightly shifting them in the simulation. But the question now is, how can we remove a single water molecule from the HSNMT1 binding site? And that was a kind of challenging task. And again, we did some site-directed mutagenesis, exchanging residues to those we find in LMNMT for HSNMT1 mutant, and up to eight residues had to be exchanged. Indeed, this includes the three residues from the binding site discussed earlier, but also here, these two residues, methionine and valine, in LMNMT exchanged to a rather small alanine and leucine 453 in HSNMT1 and some of the surrounding residues here that we might introduce a clash and those two residues in proximity to the tyrosine discussed. Um, I'm not going to in much into detail of these residues. But we ended up with this HSNMT1 with eight exchanged residues and looked in our assay and indeed we found that compound five, this was which was selective for LMNMT, inhibits this eight times mutant in a potency quite similar to what we see in LMNMT and basically abolishing the selectivity.
Of course, we wanted to narrow down these eight mutations to a smaller subset or maybe to a single one, but so far we were not yet able to find the combination. It seems to be a combination that's causing that selectivity or this affinity increase, but it seems to be not a simple one. Additionally, we were already able to solve the crystal structure of this HS NMT1 with the eight exchange residues. Unfortunately, not in a complex, but the APO structure. And it's okay, it's difficult to discuss water positions because the resolution is of 1.9 angstrom. That's not that great, but we find the hydration site present in only one of four monomers. And this hydration site is slightly shifted by around one angstrom to what we find in the wild type. So this might be sufficient to offer the space needed for this compound five to bind in this sub pocket, not interfering in a negative way with the water molecule and thereby increasing affinity. At this point, we had two selective inhibitors, but two different explanations for the selectivity. So we wanted to profile additional inhibitors. And luckily we got in contact with Ed Tate from the Empirical, Imperial College in London, who kindly provided the three molecules, all open conformation binding ligands, compound seven being non-selective, compound six and eight being selective. And we tested them against LMNMT. I told you before it was LDNMT originally developed for, but LMNMT, we've seen the same selectivity profile. And it was uh, confirmed for LMNMT as well. And for our HSNMT1 with the eight point mutations, with the eight exchange residues, we've seen, we've observed the increased affinity, abolishing the selectivity as we expected. And we also tested against our mutant with the one exchange or three exchange residues discussed earlier, the residues decisive for the selectivity of compound four, the bulky sulfonamide. And we saw that compound six is not that much affected, but this compound eight is getting more potent against those mutant forms as well. That was on first sight a little bit surprising because it's an open conformation binding inhibitor. But if you look at the crystal structure, we observed something we also observed for the compound four, compound four with this bulky aliphatic keto recycle over there close to the C terminus, but also for this compound eight, we see a bulky residue or bulky moieties being close to the C terminus, causing a rigidification of this region, maybe comparable to compound four. So it does really make sense that compound eight kind of behaves like compound four already and this mutation might be sufficient to abolish selectivity. So the title at some point promised to give the answer on how to design selective ligands for a conserved binding site, but so far we have only discussed how to elucidate selectivity determining features. So let's see if we could exploit what we've learned to identify novel lig ligands being um, more or less high affinity inhibitors of LMNMT, but being selective over HSNMT1. And this was done by a virtual screening, starting from SYNC database and some very, very basic physical chemical property filters. But the maybe most important part was, was a pharmacophoric query, where we had five essential features. We first wanted to have an open conformation, open conformation binding molecule. And for affinity, we wanted it to have an H bond acceptor for the serine residue, part of or attached to an aromatic system. We also wanted a basic center over here for an ionic interaction with the C terminus of NMT. And we also wanted an aromatic system over here to nicely stack in between the aromatic residues. This linker is found in nearly every inhibitor. And what's now important is the selectivity marker, this gray sphere over here. This is corresponding to the C2 carbon of the indole core of compound five. And this is what would inf interfere with the water molecule of the off target of HSNMT1, the red sphere here. If we have any atom, no matter what it is, binding in this region, we would somehow have interference with the water molecule one of HSNMT1 and thereby hopefully ending with the selective ligand. And all features of this pharmacophoric query were essential. So after it, we ended up with around 8,000 molecules that were subsequently docked with leaded without any constraints. And after post-inspection and rescoring with the height scoring function, 
we ended up ordering and purchasing the six most promising compounds. And luckily, three of them were binding to LMNMT or inhibiting LMNMT with a decent potency. Please note it's now micromolar inhibition, not nanomolar as before, but I think for initial virtual screening hits, it's quite okay. And the structures are not that surprising, but at least they are novel. And what's most important is they are not only inhibiting LMNMT, but they are also, as we wanted, selective over HSNMT1. Of course, we checked in our HSNMT1 mutant with the eight exchange residues, and again, these molecules all became more potent inhibitors. Selectivity was abolished, so in this case, we seem to be here right for the right reason. The selectivity seems to be really triggered by interaction with this water molecule. So let's sum it up. We started off some of two um, targets and an off target with a highly conserved binding site and some non selective and selective inhibitors from the literature. And we used this combination of computational and experimental methods to first identify the selectivity determining features that we elucidated by mutagenesis. And we found two of them for this conserved binding site. On the one side, the sidechain's flexibility seems to be highly impaired in the off-target by bulky residues. But on the other hand, we find that the water molecule in the off-target HSNMT1 seems to be so strongly bound to interfere with some inhibitors binding that this explicit water molecule might cause selectivity for other inhibitors. And to prove this, up to eight residues needed to be exchanged between LMNMT and HSNMT1. Maybe less are necessary, but we ended up with this eight mutant. And knowing this feature, this, this important water molecule helped us to be exploited for the design of three novel inhibitors with the desired selectivity profile. And maybe if you next time have a challenging target off target pair with a highly conserved binding site, you may risk deep diving into the structure having a look at every structure, every water molecule, and maybe using Richard Feynman's word, you find the differences in the jiggling and wiggling of a certain residue, a certain side chain, a certain water molecule that helps you to, to design your inhibitor with the desired selectivity profile. That's from my side. I thank you for your kind attention, but I also want to thank some other people first. First of all, Ruth Prenk, who was my supervisor at the time of this project and also Josef Kerein and Elmar Jenicke for their support with the crystallography, Christoph Borek and Edmund Fleischer from the Schirmeister Lab in Mainz for the synthesis of the organic compounds, our great lab te technicians Sabine in Mainz and, and Kahn in Bergen, Benny Merget from the Sotlefer Lab, lab in Würzburg for the support and guidance in the MD simulations that were performed on the high performance computing cluster Mogon in Mainz, at Tate for the kind gift of the three compounds, six to eight, and of course the DFG for project funding, and you again for your kind attention. Thank you.